you very much. It's an honor to, to kick off this symposium. As Melissa mentioned, I've been working in the basin since the 80s. My husband jokes that by the time I retire, maybe I'll do a project in Buena Vista, but we'll see about that. I've been stuck in the upper basin and loving it for the whole time and hope I've contributed something to help understand the water quality issues up here. So what I'm going to talk to today is talking about remedi remediation options for draining abandoned mine tunnels. And as you know, there are plenty of them up here. And I will focus, I'll give you a general overview of what the issue is in case you're not familiar with it, although I expect in this audience many people are. And then uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the solutions, the potential solutions, and then the solutions that have been applied up here, focusing on the Dinero Tunnel in the Sugarloaf Mining District. So what is the issue? We'll talk about um, why these draining mines are a problem, some of the solutions to them. Um, one of the solutions that's been pretty popular up here are in, is installing bulkheads, so we'll talk about that and look at some examples. And then finally look at the local example, as I mentioned, Dinero Tunnel in the Sugarloaf Mining District. What are draining mines? These are horizontal or vertical excavations into bedrock that were used for either accessing ore or pulling ore out of the mountain. They're installed as entries to the mine or haulage locations. They're sometimes installed as drains or were installed as drains to lower the water table within the mountain and alleviate the need to pump water out of mine working. So as mining was happening from the top down, they'd encounter the water table and have to employ a lot of energy to pump the water out and so they'd often drill a tunnel much lower in the mountain to help drain that water and alleviate the cost for, of pumping. Sometimes these tunnels weren't a problem, didn't, didn't produce water during the mining excavation, or they, they may have, but some of them started to flow after mining. And the initial intent may not have been drainage, it may have just been accessing or hauling ore, but then they, be, they began to collect water and drain it out of the mountain. Um, these tunnels and other mine workings alter the hydrology of the site, which is part of what causes the current problem and part of what is so hard to figure out when we're trying to remediate these, if, particularly if a bulkhead is installed, how the hydrology is going to change and is, that, is it going to change in a way that's favorable for water quality or potentially not favorable. So the mine drainage um, reaction is shown up here for people who like equations, but for those who don't, it's very simple. Pyrite or fool's, fool's gold is an iron sulfur mineral. You add air and water, you produce iron hydroxide and sulfuric acid. And the sulfuric acid is really most of the problem here because once you've produced that acid and you're in an area where there are lead, zinc, uh, copper minerals, those minerals are generally susceptible to attack by the acid. They dissolve and all of a sudden things that were once solid in the rock are now dissolved in the water and that's where they really become a problem for aquatic life communities and sometimes even human health. So some examples, uh, this is a tunnel up in Montana and you can see the accumulation of the iron hydroxide up here but this water is probably pretty acid as well. And then uh, this is a tunnel um, with draining green water, it's so rich in copper that the minerals that are precipitating out on the bottom of the bed are, are copper rich minerals. So um, as, as you probably know, there are thousands of river miles in the U.S. that are contaminated by drainage from abandoned mines and mine waste. Acid mine drainage can be generated underground in mine workings, but also at the surface from minerals that are stored in mine waste. As water flows over those materials, the pyrite can mix with air and water and produce that sulfuric acid that causes so many problems. Mine drainage from these sources then contaminates water bodies and also can contaminate groundwater. Some examples of draining mine tunnels, this is a paradise portal, excuse me, over in um, the Animus River drainage. This is our very own Dinero Tunnel here in Lake County. The Sawatch Tunnel, which is also uh, in the Sugarloaf Mining District just south of Turquoise Lake. This is a tunnel draining in Creed, Colorado. This is going inside that tunnel. You can um, see some of the different minerals that are accumulating in the water that's flowing out of it. Uh, another tunnel, and so, so we've got all these things happening. What are some of the solutions to these tunnels? Um, and a solution that's been very effective up here in Leadville is to install a treatment plant at the portal. Both the Yak Tunnel and the Leadville Mine Drainage Tunnel have treatment plants at the portal that have been very effective in helping improve water quality in the Arkansas River. 
There's also something that's broadly referred to as hydrologic controls. And what this means is that you actually go into the tunnel and you try and find all the different sources of water that are contributing to the water flowing out of the tunnel and control those sources if you can. That is, separate the good water from the bad water. So sometimes in a tunnel uh, you may have a lot of water flowing out at the mouth but where that water comes into the tunnel, back further in the workings, it might be very clean. And so if we can separate that from the minerals in the tunnel and from the other dirty water that it's mixing with, it might Im help improve water quality or minimize the need for treatment at the mouth. Alternately, we might want to minimize water flowing into these tunnels from the surface. If we can understand that maybe a lot of snow melts contributing to the tunnel and there's a glory hole up on the top that's a big sink for water that then feeds it in through the tunnel, we might be able to do something about that. So that's what meant, is meant by hydrologic controls. There are also some in situ treatment methods and I'll show you an example of that and what this means is putting materials in the mine that, that help, help neutralize that mine drainage reaction. And then finally there's bulkhead emplacement that we'll talk about a little bit more. So what are some of the pros and cons of those four treatments I outlined? Uh, treatment at the portal is very effective. It can uh, solve the problem as we've seen up here in Leadville, but you're looking at operation and maintenance in perpetuity, which can be quite expensive. The hydrologic controls that I mentioned likely have low operation and maintenance, but it requires mine access and quite a bit of money up front if you need to open up a mine. But those have been effective in some areas. Um, in situ treatment likely has um, low operation and maintenance costs, but it could be an incomplete mechanism, and I'll show you an example of that. And the bulkheads um, of all of these are maybe the most controversial um, because the people are worried that they won't last for a while, for a long time. Um, the problem might you might plug the bulkhead, and it's like a you know, the old uh, Dutchman in the, the dike, you, you put your finger in one hole and the water starts squirting out somewhere else and it may be, may be an even worse location where it starts squirting out. So there's a lot of sort of um, fear of that when you talk about bulkheads. Um, in addition, the flow of the bulkhead is mostly stopped, but not completely. There may be some leakage around the bulkhead. And th there are low operation and maintenance costs, but people wonder how long these things are going to last. So this is an example of some in situ treatment. Um, in, so these are, this is a cross section showing the mine workings. The draining tunnel here is caved, caved in and the, apparently at this site they, didn't, they decided they couldn't afford or didn't want to go in and try and figure out what was going on. So instead they had some vertical access points where they injected a substrate made up of uh, cow manure, straw and sawdust. This is a biological sulfate reaction that's supposed to take the, the sulfuric acid and put it back into the solid form, produce sulfide minerals that is. So remove the oxygen from that reaction and, and help slow down the mine drainage reaction and even reverse it. And at the mouth of this tunnel, so since they didn't put a bulkhead in, this tunnel, tunnel still continued to drain but they wanted to change the water quality. And they did increase the pH and produce some alkalinity. They decreased concentrations of aluminum, cadmium, copper, and zinc, but some metals ended up having, and metalloids ended up having higher concentrations. So as I indicated on the, complete, the previous slide, this can sometimes be an incomplete treatment. But what my, what, what's happening more and more is all of the solutions I showed you on the previous slide are sometimes being combined. So you might put in a bulkhead, but then put in some of these materials too to help um, improve the water quality of what's leaking around the bulkhead. You might do some hydrologic controls as well to minimize the water that's coming out of the bulkhead, etc. So how does a bulkhead work? It helps prevent acute water quality degradation from blowouts. And the people from Leadville who were here in the 80s remember the famous blowouts at the Yak Tunnel. And what that means is that somewhere back in the mine workings, there's essentially a, a dam breaks and water comes flooding out the mouth of the mine. And the idea between, behind these bulkheads is that they are structural, structurally sound and should be able to contain and regulate the flow of a blowout so that if there is a valve in the bulkhead, the blowout water would come out slowly and not as a big flood that would, would in, in, uh, degrade water quality downstream. And if you have infrastructure in front of a tunnel, such as a treatment plant, you might need a bulkhead anyway if you're in an area where blowouts are, are a potential problem to protect all that infrastructure you've built out in front of the tunnel. 
It backs up water. The bulkhead backs up water in the mine, which alters the hydrologic equilibrium in the surrounding area. And basically, just think of it as putting, putting your finger in a dike or in a leak of some sort. And when you do that, the water behind whatever was leaking starts to rise. The pressure rises. And so when that happens, that water can come out in other places and springs and things like that. In theory, it should raise the water table above the level of these acid-generating minerals. And it take, does, uh, dissolved oxygen takes a long time to travel through water. So if you limit oxygen for these reactions, you should limit the reactions and limit the amount of acid that's generated. So in theory, it might result in smaller quantities of flow at several locations, which in the right locations could ev in conditions could evaporate before reaching water bodies. So this is just a diagram to try and explain what the past slide explained in words. Before we put in a bulkhead, we have this draining tunnel. We have percolating water and air that are getting into the mountain and, and uh, creating this acid, and then the acid picks up metals and comes out. Um, this brown area represents the ore body where the minerals are stored. If we put a bulkhead in, we have this pre-mining water table down here, and as we put in the bulkhead, the water table may rise up into these minerals. So you can see not as much of the ore body is exposed to air as it was before, and it's all covered in water, which should sl theoretically slow down this reaction. So we went through this before, but in theory, this is the most important part. It sh the bulkhead should raise the water table above the level of acid gen generating minerals, and dissolved oxygen concentration should gradually decrease. If that's not true, your bulkhead might not work as well as you thought. Um, and then this, this statement about smaller quantities of flow at several locations, which in the right conditions could evaporate, it could also result in the same amount of flow coming out somewhere else, which is less desirable, and that's what many people fear with these things. But these, these ideas are why people think about putting in bulkheads. A couple examples of bulkhead. This is the um, a bulkhead at a place called the Walker Mine. John Abel uh, gave me these slides to show. And this is the fresh bulkhead. You can see it's concrete. It has a couple of relief valves here, and it's installed uh, right in the mine itself. This is a little bit after installation. You can see the bulkhead looks a bit wet. There is leakage around it, but the seepage is about a quarter of a gallon per minute. And there's a little seepage pond in front, but this is 11 years later, and this thing is still doing a pretty good job. This is a different bulkhead in Colorado, the Roy Prey Mine. Um, just shows the bulkhead after installation. You can see the, the um, relief valve is flowing, but there's not much leakage around this one. It's pretty wet down here, but it didn't look, doesn't look as wet as that previous one did. Um, quick look at a bulkhead design, just to emphasize that these things are, um, excuse me, not just a three-foot plug of concrete. They're about 15 or more feet thick. They're engineered to hold up to um, both the pressure of, of the water behind them, the increased pressure from a flood event or a blowout event, and also um, the um, uh, caustic properties of the acid that's behind them. So the concrete is designed to be as resistant as possible to acid decay. And this is a slide, we're moving now to the De Niro area, slide and cross-section of the De Niro bulkhead. You can see it's also, you can't read these very well, but it's also 15 feet thick. It's keyed into the bedrock. It's located about 1,250 feet back in the mine tunnel, so it has a lot of rock pressure above it to help it contain the water pressure that's built up behind it. This is a picture of the De Niro bulkhead after close. It's been closed now for three years this fall. Um, it has a relief valve um, down here, but you can't quite see the whole thing. But you can see that it leaks a little bit. It leaks um, from one, about one to five gallons a minute, but the previous flow was 40 to 80 gallons a minute. So we've had a very nice reduction in flow. And we'll look at um, some of the things now that you can do before and after a bulkhead to, <coughs> excuse me, initially try and decide if the bulkhead's going to do a good job and then things you can look at after um, to make sure the bulkhead's doing a good job, or if not, um, to, to keep an eye on it. Um, some of the things that you can use to try and understand what's going to happen when the hydrology changes is have a good understanding of geology and fractures. Some of the things you can use to help understand that are um, monitoring wells, borehole geophysics, 
groundwater modeling, <coughs> additional subsurface and surface studies. <coughs> My apologies, the algae season has not been kind to me this year. You can use fancy things like isotopes and groundwater age dating to try and understand the hydrology in the mountain. But what we did at De Niro was look at baseline geochemistry and hydrology with detailed sampling around the mountain. The objectives of this study were to try and monitor the effect of the bulkhead on local water quality and flow to make sure when we put that plug in it didn't come out somewhere that we were not expecting it to. We wanted to understand water quality and flow before installation of the bulkhead. <clears throat> this entailed walking the area behind and surrounding the De Niro tunnel and identifying existing springs and seeps during high flow, but we also do this before every sampling trip. And then we developed a monitoring plan and constituents for after installation of the bulkhead. Compare that data from before the bulkhead to after the bulkhead. And I'll show you some of that data today, those data. So this is the area um, just south of Turquoise Lake. This is the Sugarloaf Mining District. De Niro Tunnel is right here. And you can see our sampling sites here, but they show up better on the next map. So hold on if you can't see things very well. We sampled between 40 and 60 sites. We've had um, two sampling events every year from 2010 to 2012. Our last two are coming up. We do those events during high and low flow to kind of bracket the conditions. We look at both flow coming out of every feature or at every location and the water quality. We do reconnaissance for new sites before each trip. The students here at Colorado Mountain College are working, we're working together with them and they do a lot of hiking on that mountain before we go out there and sample to, with GPS units to locate new features. Ultimately we'll compare all these 2010 to 2012 data with the 2006 data. This is a, a little bit easier to see on this slide, our sample locations, the De Niro Tunnel, uh, there are a couple other mine tunnels in the area, Nelson Tunnel, Bartlett Tunnel, and Sawatch Tunnel. Um, you can see the, a lot of the mine waste too, all these barren areas or mine waste areas where things don't grow well. We're going to focus in on this area near the De Niro Tunnel and look at some of the monitoring results there. And just briefly, the philosophy of the sampling was to sample all the gulches that bordered the tunnel, but then to go out to adjacent gulches. This gulch called Strawberry Gulch is very wet, has a lot of wetland features, and we were concerned that it might be kind of a, a regional groundwater discharge and that somehow the water from the tunnel might make it over here. Um, also, Sawatch Tunnel, we're monitoring that to see if the water is somehow making it over there. But you can see, as far as we know, there's no connection between these mine workings, which is good. Um, I'm going to show you results for De Niro Tunnel itself. And then two sites, this area drains this whole De Niro tunnel area and these two gulches. And then LF580 is, is the first site we have below Sugarloaf Dam on Lake Fork Creek. So this is a site we want to look at to see if the tunnel's been doing a good job or not. And uh, unfortunately, this, this De Niro tunnel label up here is wrong. It's one of the instances where the USGS made a mistake, I'm sorry to say. But there is a little tunnel up there. So what we're going to do, um, this table shows results, and I'll, I'll, don't, don't try and read all the numbers. I will help you focus in on what you need to see. This shows De Niro Tunnel. We have flow, pH, and zinc load. Same for that area that drains the De Niro Tunnel area, and same for the Lake Fork Creek site. Flow, pH, and zinc load. So first, let's look at the low flow data. This compares October 2006 to September 2010. And you can see we have a very nice reduction in zinc load at the mouth. That's a mass of zinc coming out per unit time. So a very nice reduction in load, more than an order of magnitude. If we move to this site that drains the De Niro Tunnel area, we can see similarly a very nice reduction in load and also, importantly, an increase in pH. And that helps, just increasing pH helps take some of the metals out of solution naturally. And then finally, at the Lake Fork, we have a very nice, <coughs> Excuse me. Reduction in zinc load, so positive results during low flow. Um, similarly, during high flow between June 06 and June 10, we had a good reduction in load at the De Niro, and also during that really high flow event last year, De Niro was still, even though it's flowing a little bit more and leaking a little bit more, it still had was, load was much reduced compared to this year. 
However, at um, that site that drains De Niro, the first high flow comparison was really good, but last year kind of tested things, and it was because, we think it was because those other gulches have mine waste in them, and they were flowing more than usual during the high flow event. So we think we captured some of that with this event. And um, also, Lake Fort Creek had some issues. We see between June 06 and 2010, we saw a nice reduction, similar to what we see down here, <clears throat> but a, a big increase in June 2011. And we're still working with the data, uh, but expect it's, it's um, occurring because uh, there's, there's a lot of mine waste up here that was making it to Lake Fort Creek during that really high runoff event last year. And so we think it's probably mine waste from these other gulches, including um, Bartlett Tunnel that's coming into Lake Fort Creek um, between, uh, along this reach here. The dam is just right up here. So preliminary results show that in general there are no major or obvious changes showing gross rerouting of De Niro to other locations. So we put our finger in the dike and so far it's not really coming out anywhere else. So that's good. The dike is holding up. Um, we saw improvement of pH and metal loads at that site that drains the De Niro area. Uh, almost a 90% decrease in flow, but also there's a little bit of dilution in, in metal concentrations at the tunnel. There's a little bit of pressure release from water behind the De Niro tunnel because those two gulches that I pointed out on either side of the tunnel seem to have more water in the fall than they did before the tunnel was put in. So there's a little bit more flow up there. Um, the De Niro bulkhead itself responded well to the 2011 high flow event, but there were some other loading sources that we saw that may or may not need attention, but we know they're there now and that's good. We knew they were there before, but we didn't know they were making it that far downstream. So in summary, draining abandoned mines can degrade water quality. The solutions range from in situ treatment of water to installation of active treatment plants. Bulkheads are potential solutions for these sites, and to date, the De Niro bulkhead has improved water quality in Lake Fork. Um, but we're continuing to watch it, and also with the BLM, even though our monitoring program ends this fall, we're working with them to try and develop a longer-term monitoring proposal, again in conjunction, hopefully, with folks up here in, at the college. So with that, I'll turn it over. Okay.